uh, mammalian physiology. We're gonna um, next time we'll we'll get into uh, water stress and locomotion, but this time we'll talk mostly about the thermoregulation of mammals, which even though they're they're all considered to be endotherms, has a quite very quite a lot of variation within them. So uh, first thing, the mammals are what type of have what type of a thermoregulation strategy? Mammals. Mammals in general. Homo, homeo, homeothermic. Okay, what does that mean? So that's endothermic. Right, so internal environment, their metabolism helps regulate their body temperature. That's what endothermy means. Okay? But they are also generally homeotherms as well, which means what? No. So, so they are endotherms. Okay, we'll go over it. Um, so endotherm means internal environment. Ectotherms means they regulate by their external environment. Homeotherms means they uh, maintain their body temperature within a narrow range, right? Which goes along with endothermy, generally, like there's this narrow range. Whereas an ectotherm is gonna have a wide range, all right? All right, and then what's a poikilotherm? Right, so it varies with the temperature of their surroundings, um, which is similar to ectotherm, but ectotherm can kind of go to different areas and increase or decrease their body temperature. So a poikilotherm then varies with their surroundings, so they are not a ho generally not a homeotherm. And then a heterotherm means that they can be both a homeotherm or a poikilotherm. So they can have a narrow range and they can alter their body temperature. So that's, you can be multiple things though, right? Species can be multiple things. All right, but generally this, uh, Endotherms are homeotherms, and they follow this same sort of pattern, which we're going to show on this graph here. So in ambient temperature, so this is the temperature of the air and surroundings, um, this, of course, varies uh, depending on the environment, but uh, it, if a mammal is outside, exposed to the air, then throughout the day it's going to change, right? And if it's in a temporal environment or a seasonal environment, it's going to change throughout the seasons as well. But in uh, most or a large range of that ambient temperature, it's going to keep its metabolic rate the same. And thus also its internal temperature the same. And this is called the thermoneutral zone. Okay, so in this, and it's different per species, but in this species, um, till about 20 degrees Celsius and just under zero degrees Celsius, that's its thermoneutral zone. So it can just modify its internal, modify its metabolism. Um, to remain pretty neutral. It doesn't have to expend very much energy to keep its temperature the same. Above the thermoneutral zone, then, it's going to have to increase its metabolism to do what? Yes. to dissipate the heat, to release it from its body. It's got too much heat, it has to get rid of it. Below that temperature, 
below that thermoneutral zone, it's going to have to produce heat, increase its metabolism to produce heat in order to maintain that body temperature. Okay, so what are then some strategies for heat dissipation? Sweating. Panting. Any other ones? So what type of, what'd you say? Okay. Um, that's that's part of uh, panting, and it's it's part of the efficiency. But it's yeah. Circulation, right? Like rat ears, where they put it through their ears so that mm -hmm. it loses its the heat to the air. Okay. Yeah. So large. Um, like having your blood flow close to the skin. There you go. Vasodilation. So if you increase your blood flow to the skin, that's where heat exchange occurs. So that, that occurs when they are hot. They can release the heat. And then they will generally have these extremities with the large surface area. I just said SA, surface area. Okay, what about size? If you want to release heat, is it good to be big or good to be small? Yeah. Bigger, smaller? Okay, you guys fight. Okay, good, yeah. You want small surface area to volume ratio. All right, so the surface area, again, the surface is where you're going to release heat. And the volume, the interior, the core, that's where you're going to produce heat. So if you have lots of surface area, you can get rid of heat easier. So if an elephant overheats, it's in trouble because it doesn't have, its volume is too big compared to its surface area. So it has to... Um, it's going to have to have other physiological processes for releasing heat. They have the big ears. Mm -hmm. sweat. I think they do, yeah. And then they always, you always see them spraying water on themselves. Yep. So they can duck that. I don't know what that would help. Uh, yeah. There's like a natural cooling thing. That's why a lot of animals like you see laying dirt. Yeah, so another thing people, the people, the, um, <laughs> mammals can do. Are, yeah, that's true. Behaviors, okay, such as going to the water hole or spraying um, water on themselves or fanning themselves or going to the shade or making little structures where they can be in the shade or going into the shaded part of rocks and rocks, depending on the rock, will pull heat away from the skin as well. Yeah, and underground, okay? Creating burrows. Oh, in a video lecture, it says wood middens. Okay, so they're wood rats. Um, we actually saw one in the Natural Bridge Cave. Oh, right, the burrows, yeah. And they actually make like little wood tents. They get a bunch of little sticks and they pile them together and then they'll hide under them That's to stay cool. Yeah. They have a lot of funny behaviors that are fun. Yeah. Okay. So, heat dissipation. Um, 
we as humans aren't really good at dissipating heat. Um, we can sweat, we don't pant. We can vasodilate to our skin. Our extremities aren't very large, we don't have huge ears or anything. Um, and so we don't do very well in hot environments. We actually do a little better in colder environments because, yeah. So it's easier to be, it's easier to be over here than it is to be over here for humans. Yeah. Yeah, we are rather large. Okay, what about on the other end? What are mechanisms of heat production? Okay, so in this instance, we're going to be, have a large surface area to volume ratio. So in this, we're trying to reduce heat loss. Okay, so a lot of a lot of these are just the opposite, right? Uh, right. So rather than vasodilation, we'll have vasoconstriction. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's temporal hypothermia and then adaptive hypothermia. So yeah, we'll put hypothermia there. I think it's just let your body decrease in temperature. And you could put then on the other, this is a, one of a strategy as well, hyperthermia. Okay, mm -hmm. what else? Okay, good. So you can have fur. Or blubber. Okay, why don't we just have fur or just have blubber? Why? What kind of animals have blubber over fur? Okay, and what's... Right, yeah, so... And why is that? Why don't they just have lots of fur? Why not? Well, otters have fur. <laughs> Beavers have fur. Beavers have fur. It does, right? Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, the aerodynamics of fur. Although there are a lot of seals with fur. Yeah, and they're still like, but they're in general fluffy. Well, sea lions have a lot of fur, and like fur seals have a lot of fur. Also, you don't see anything that like stays in like the whole, its whole life in the like in the water. Like, mm -hmm. like sea lions, they can come out of the water. Right. Water can come out of the water. Right. So why do cetaceans have blubber instead of fur? Because there's, there's like a coating over it that's waterproof, right? Skin. Mm -hmm. Whereas like fur, no matter how thick it is, it'll eventually. What? Wet. Yes, and that's it. Weigh more. Well, it's not the weight. It's just that the thermal conduction conduction increases when it gets wet. Yeah. So if your if your fur is dry, then it's great. But if it gets wet, then it no longer is effective, or as effective. And blubber, blubber is going to stay the same. Okay. Good. All right. We got more though. Fur, blubber. Large surface area to volume ratio. Any vasoconstriction. There's one that you guys do that's not on here. <clears throat> and I don't think it was mentioned in the. Shiver? Yeah. Shivering. And another one we talked about last time that babies do when they can't shiver. Oh, oh. <laughs> nope. Okay, good. So making metabolic heat through burning a brown fat. Brown fat has lots of mitochondria and I'm just right here. Okay. Um, I might have written it down wrong. Is it 
regional heterothermia or regional hypothermia? So yeah, heterothermia, heterothermia means they're allowing their body to change. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Temperature. Could be above or below. Okay. So wait, but regional, what does that mean then? Um, I just wrote extremities are the last drop in temperature above core events. So allowing your extremities to cool while keeping your core warm. Okay. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're outside and it's cold enough, your hands will go numb, they will become colder, but your, your core should stay warm. Hypothermia is when you actually, your core starts to drop as well. Okay, and then with the extremities and the vasoconstriction, you also have, I'm going to put XC. Close. Counter current, heat exchange of your blood vessels. Okay, and we'll um, actually talk about that after we finish this list. Which I think is, it looks pretty good. Anything we're missing? Okay, you've got insulative layers such as fur, blubber. You have metabolic heat through burning fat or shivering. Both of those are actually metabolic heat. Your muscles producing heat. Uh, vasoconstriction to the extremities, right? To the skin and the extremities. All right, what about the size and shape of the extremities? Are you gonna have big ears and long legs and big feet? You have small extremities. Your ears are going to be really small. Your body is going to be nice and fat. You should be able to tuck into a ball. So Arctic foxes can actually tuck all the way in into a ball, which is also a thermodynamic shape. A ball is going to lose heat much less than you know sprawled out. Right? Um, and they can they can handle some really cold temperatures. 40 below stuff. So. Okay. All right, I think that's a good list, though. We may be missing one or two, but I think that's pretty close. All right, so let's talk about countercurrent heat exchange. Have you guys heard of this before? None of you have had me. I think I teach it in every one of my classes, but. Did we do it in um, 202? Uh, I can't remember either. <laughs> okay, so. Um, your arteries. Oh, yeah, I do remember this. Okay. I think we talked about it with physiology. Mm -hmm. Arteries are going away from the heart, and the veins are going back to the heart. Okay, and let's say they're running in the same direction. And the arteries are going to have the heat from the heart, from the core. And the veins are going to be cool because they just came from, you know, the skin. So if we're measuring units of heat, let's say this one has 100. The artery has 100. And the vein is starting with zero. Which way is the heat going to flow? towards the vein, right? And so at every step along there, you're going to have heat going from the artery to the vein. And for every heat that the artery loses, the vein gains. Okay, how long is this going to go for? In 
until you come to an equilibrium of 50-50. So at this point, you can't get any warmer or cooler. The exchange is going to maximize at 50%. Okay, so this is actually not countercurrent. This is uh, concurrent. Okay, which actually doesn't happen, but in countercurrent, the arteries running that way. And the vein is running in the opposite direction. And so now if the artery, again, it just came from the core, so it's at 100. And the vein, it just came from the skin, so it's at 0. Essentially, you can have exchange going all the way across. And even if this artery has given almost all of its heat, it's still going to continually give to the, to the vein. And then the vein, which is going the opposite direction, is going to gain heat all the way in the opposite direction. And where is the equilibrium? It's going to be at, you know, 99%, almost 100. So when the vein comes back to the heart, it has been warmed by the blood going to the skin. And that way you don't have to spend any energy heating that blood back up. It'll just be almost as warm as when it left. And so what uh, organisms had the countercurrent heat exchange? I'm um, sorry. Yeah, countercurrent. Yes. The dolphins. Okay, so they let their flippers get cold, and they have the countercurrent exchange, uh, exchange system in their blood vessels so that they can warm up that blood when it returns back to the core. Um, and they also use that to keep their testes cool. Their internal testes are going to be hugged up against the, um, the body cavity, and they need to keep them cooler, so they'll use cool um, blood from the extremities or from the skin to cool down the testes. Okay. All right. Um, so metabolic rate is um, an important uh, characteristic studied for physiology of lots of organisms. How do you measure metabolic rate? What is metabolic rate based on? What is your metabolism based on? Food. Okay, what about food? Mm -hmm. So you break it down to release energy and then you use that energy for what? Mm -hmm. um, Heat, locomotion, what else do you use energy for? Exercise. Exercise, locomotion. <laughs> okay, good. Pumping your blood. Uh, brain activity. Okay, you got to keep a fuel supply going to your brain. Internal organs. Mm -hmm. Digestion. Urinary system, like all this requires energy, right? So that's what your metabolic rate is, how you're using this energy to maintain homeostasis in all the different systems. So 
the basal metabolic rate, that's BMR, is defined as your resting metabolic rate. Okay, so how do you use energy? What's the cellular process? In your cells, how do you how do you use energy? No. Yeah, how do you make ATP? <laughs> what, Aaron? Okay, that's part of it. What? Well, there's well, this one isn't for ATP, but there's Krebs cycle. Yes, it is for ATP. Oh, what's that? What's the whole thing? And then um, it's ATP synthase, which is right. So you you get in the parts. What's the whole thing called? Where does it occur? It occurs. I told you. Gabe. Did you just tell me? My bio tutor. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Gabe. <laughs> Sitting on that belt. Answer the whole time. <laughs> Aerobic cellular respiration. Okay. Okay. So, what are the inputs and outputs of cellular respiration? Uh, input is glucose, and output is glycogen. 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 Okay, what did you say? No, glucose. Glucose. And then what was the output? Water. And ATP. Okay, you're missing some things. What is it called again? Oh, uh, oxygen. Okay, good. Oxygen. All right, so now we're good here, but there's something else on the other side. Good, okay. All right, so if you want to measure metabolic rate, what are some things you could measure? Oxygen. Okay, good. So that's one way metabolic rate is measured, by oxygen in intake. And some t it's abbreviated as VO2. What else could you measure? I mean, like calories and glucose and stuff like that. Okay, if you could measure the actual energy going in versus energy coming out, versus energy coming out you could do that. How much water is CO2? You could look at water. That would be hard unless it's on a cellular level. But the problem is, what's, what's the problem with water? Evaporates, right? You drink it, yeah. right? And so, if you could measure all the water going in and all the water going out, yeah. Um, okay, what else though? Similar to this one. Uh, CO2. Right, CO2 output, okay? All right, so that's why I have this diagram here. You can put a little animal in this, um, contraption that has a controlled amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide going into it um, and then measure the oxygen that it uses and measure the carbon dioxide that it produces and estimate metabolic rate based on that. Okay, this, however, this contraption, this is kind of the original way of measuring um, uh, no. It's a cal caloric intake is also a way to measure metabolic rate. So how many calories are they consuming? Um, so this is called a calorimeter because um, we know how much how many calories it takes, or we know how much energy it takes to melt water. So all they did was they put this animal in here. It has an insulative layer and then it has a layer of ice, and they put it in there for a certain amount of time, and then they measured the water that comes out.
<laughs> right. So that's one of the problems with trying to find a basal meso metabolic rate. How can you make sure that they are actually completely at rest? So maybe being in a small box. Wouldn't they be trying to get out? I, I feel like that. I would be trying to get yeah. out. Yeah. like most of the small rooms try to put in a little place with box. They're like. Maybe, but maybe if it's dark and it's closed, then and it's habituated to it before. Maybe you'd have to let introduce it, like, put it in there for a little bit. Could you make like <laughs> put in a little like some, sofa. Some Maybe, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things you could do, but this is, yeah, this is kind of the first way they measured the amount of energy it's, it's using. All right, so those are a couple ways. Field metabolic rates, these are harder to measure. If you want to measure how much energy is this animal going to use when it's out doing its thing, you know, finding food, attracting mates, raising young, whatever it does. Okay, so here's a more complicated way, um, but is generally pretty effective for measuring a field meta metabolic rate. And this is called the doubly labeled water technique. All right, so what they do is they take hydrogen and oxygen isotopes. What's an isotope? Okay, what's different about isotopes? So if I have two isotopes of hydrogen, what's the difference? One's usually weak. Yes, okay, so they have different weights. Right. What's that? They have more protons, right? They have more neutrons. Neutrons. Yeah. Right? So hydrogen, we've got hydrogen one, which is the normal isotope, and then hydrogen two, which is the heavier isotope. And these are stable, meaning they aren't radioactive. They aren't going to the um, animal by injecting it into it. All right, and then oxygen. The regular isotope is 16. And then we have a heavier isotope, oxygen 18. I think oxygen 17 is radioactive or unstable. Okay, so what, what you do in this technique is you take water that has more oxygen 18 and more hydrogen 2 than usual, than is normal, and you inject it into an animal. So you can just inject it into its um, blood vessels, like a saline drip. Okay, and then you take a measurement of the ratio of hydrogen to 2 to hydrogen 1 and oxygen 16 to oxygen 18. And that's your initial measurement. Okay, so you inject it, you let it circulate, and now you have this ratio, which you've now altered. It's not normally going to be have as much as this heavier isotope in it. And then you let it go. You let it be free. And you let it do its thing for a period of time. And then when you capture it again, you measure this ratio again. Okay, and how, okay, and, and then what you should have is a difference between the hydrogen and the oxygen because it'll slowly, gradually go back to its original ratio. But the rate at which it does is different because you can get rid of oxygen Oh, in more ways than you can hydrogen. Okay, so hydrogen, you can pee. That's it. 
okay? It's gonna come out in the water that's peed. But in oxygen, you can pee it, or what, how else can you get rid of oxygen? Yeah, so it can also be exhaled. And what do we know about carbon dioxide? Okay, it's one of the outputs of metabolism. So then this difference right here, you can attribute to their metabolic rate. Does that make sense? For me, this has always been kind of hard to wrap my head around. But it makes sense to you guys. Okay, I'm just a good teacher, I guess. <laughs> All right, so you can, the, the problem with this though is you have to be able to catch it again later. All right, so you inject the bat with the water and you let it go. You've gotta have a way to catch it and take that second sample or it's not gonna work. Yeah, and the bats, you can put a tracker on there but then It'll just fly away with your tracker and you never see it again. So. Yeah, there you go. You got something. Okay. So those are the ways you measure metabolic. All right. So um, our metabolic rates with mammals, because they have this elevated or this, you know, I guess depending on their um, substrate or where they live, they'll have a, a body temperature which is not the same as the ambient temperature. So they're spending energy maintaining this body temperature. So as homeotherms, they're always expending energy to, be, to do so. We have here, just like before, our thermal neutral zone. Above that, we're going to spend energy cooling off. Below that, we're gonna spend energy warming up. And these are different sized mammals. Okay, what do you notice? This is a small size, this is a, a larger size, and this is uh, even larger, right? It's on orders of 10, so a thousand times, a hundred times that, and then a hundred times that. No, 10 times that. Um, what do you notice about the smaller versus the larger mammals? Smaller mammals have a smaller... Thermoneutral zone? Yeah, the thermoneutral zone is smaller. What about the change in metabolic rate when it gets too cold or too hot? Uh, the larger the animal, the slower the process. And like the, if you're a smaller animal, the faster the heat takes Right. Yeah, so if, if you're small and you're in, if you're not in your thermoneutral zone, you're spending a lot of energy, right? But if you're big, it's not, it's not as much different okay um, and generally for these bigger animals it's harder to cool off than it is to get warm which we already talked about right um, this then is the equation for body size um, with weight and how it relates to body temperature so TB is body temperature And then TLC, this is the lower critical limit. All right, so TLC on here, TLC, just notice it, is right here. So at this point, they're dead after that gets any colder. They can't handle it. But that is equivalent to four times their mass, mass times 0.25. And this also puts a limit on how small you can be as a mammal. So the smaller you get, the smaller this is going to shrink. 
to the point where you're so small, it just takes too much energy to maintain. And that is um, shown in the smallest mammals in the world, which are the Etruscan shoe, shrew and Kitty's hognose bat. Any guesses as to how small they are? How much do they weigh? Uh, but yeah, they are like that big. Half a gram? What do you, what you, is that what you're going to say too? It's two grams. Two grams. So that's about as small as you can be with the mammal because of the energy required to maintain your body temperature. Okay. Uh, they have to eat a lot. Constantly, yeah. Yeah. Super they have to. Right, so this shrew, and what else do you notice about the bottom of this? Okay, when you go up the, the thermal neutral zone even itself is higher, right? So the metabolic rate of smaller animals is much higher. Um, and they're giving off a lot of heat because they're small, so they can't retain heat. So they're just, they're just little furnaces, right? Um, I'm, I think these are both southeastern. The bat is in Thailand. Yeah. So it's a tropical bat. Um, but yeah, they have to have access to high energy foods constantly year round to survive. I don't know where the Etruscan shrew is. I can go for it. Okay, in addition to um, basal, meta basal metabolic rate and size, um, generally, the number of heartbeats of the Etruscan shrew, shrew and kitty's hognose bat is the same as the number of heartbeats as an elephant. So it, it's a, it correlates with your basal metabolic rate. You have a really high metabolic rate, and these have very short lives and turn over very quickly to the next generation. You have a really low metabolic rate, you're going to be really big, and the heart beats very slowly for its whole life. And then intermediates also fall on kind of the same line. Okay, we have a few minutes left. We're going to let you guys uh, pick an animal and research. Uh, most of these are in the book, some of them are not. Research their thermal regulation uh, strategies. I said polar bear. Okay, polar bear. Sea otter. Sea otter. All right. <laughs> All right, Gabe. Which one do you want? Uh, I'll do the kangaroo. The kangaroo rat. Two, three, four. All right, who am I missing? What are you doing, Eric? I'm doing the bottom of this tree. Bottom of this tree. I didn't know that was so weird. So I only have five, though. Who am I missing? 